Welcome back. In a typical day, we are faced with thousands of decisions. And for every decision, it feels like there are also thousands of studies trying to weigh in on which direction we should go in. In his new book, Relax, Damn It, author and professor Timothy Caulfield navigates the science behind our everyday decisions and tells us why we need to kind of just chill out. So welcome back to the show, Timothy. Thanks for having me on, guys. We're delighted, and we want to start things off uh, with the dedication in your book, which reads, to science, hang in there. So why do you think that science needs a bit of more a morale boost at this particular point in time? Uh, science has had a tough couple of years, you guys. Come on, yes. it's been a grind. You know, I actually think it's been tough for truth in general. So I, I wanted to give science a little bit of love. I, th it's I thought it was appropriate. I love it so much. Hey, listen, Timothy, it seems whenever one study comes out in favor of something, another study will make headlines the following day, arguing the exact opposite, which makes things very confusing for the general public. And you use the example of drinking coffee to illustrate this point. So what is really going on with these studies and how, are, and how they're reported? Well, first of all, I'm obsessed with coffee, so I have to be careful of my own biases here, you know, looking for studies that confirm my love. Um, but uh, look, coffee's a really good example of how hard it is to do good nutrition research. So many of the headlines that we see are based on observational studies. And observational studies, you know, they, they're interesting, but they don't really tell us causation, right? They don't really give you a sense of what is going on. In fact, there was an interesting study that showed that the media, you guys, <laughs> you love you love observational studies because it's usually about something we're interested in, like, you know, like coffee or should you be eating blueberries? So the bottom line is, if it's just an observational study, you should be, you know, you should be careful. So the next time we see a, a news story re reporting on a new miracle food, what should we be looking for to know how seriously we should take and treat the findings? Yeah, that's a good question. And first of all, I'm skeptical of any headline that claims there's a miracle food. That should be number one. But what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, it's really straightforward, ask yourself, what kind of evidence is being used to support this? Is it just an animal study, you know, like mice? Is it a mm -hmm. small study? Is it an observational study? If it's any of those things, be cautious, right? Also, if if someone's trying to sell you something, you know, whether it's a product or even just an ideology, you know, ask yourself, uh, is this really based on good evidence? What you want to do is you want to focus on the body of evidence, especially when it's something complex like health. Always ask yourself, okay, what does the body of evidence say about this topic? So another outlet that sometimes spreads misinformation is the wellness industry. Mm -hmm. And you cite the growing popularity of raw milk, aka, aka milk that hasn't been pasteurized as an example. Can you walk us through how health influencers can warp uh, public perception? Uh, a CDC study said that I, I think only 1.5% of people somewhere around there drinks raw milk, and it is responsible for over 95% of all milk-related illnesses. So there's good evidence to be worried about and regulate raw milk. But what, what happens is influencers like Gwyneth Paltrow, I can't help but <laughs> draw on Gwyneth, what they do is they, they use concepts like natural, like food choice right. or food freedom in order to, to push an idea, and that allows them to sidestep the science behind it. And unfortunately, research tells us that marketing strategy works. Mm. I mean, sadly, it feels like with all this misinformation or contradictory information, it creates these feelings of like fear and uh, and mistrust, and that ultimately that means it's going to influence our decision making. So you uh, cite an example of this is kind of the growing number of parents who, uh, you know, maybe back in the day, back in our day, used to let their kids walk to school. Now they're increasingly driving their kids and dropping them off because it feels quote unquote safer. You say that science says otherwise. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, the number one reason that that parents don't let their kids walk to school, that number one reason, if you believe the research, is stranger danger. They feel their kid is going to be abducted. And this is a power, I've got four kids, right? A powerful, visceral fear. And, it, and it's one that is pushed by pop culture. I mean, think about all the shows like CSI or yeah. Criminal Minds. And, you know, you, there's like evil predators on every corner. Uh, and because of that fear, people don't uh, let their kids walk to school. On the other side of the ledger, on the benefits 
side of the ledger, you have exercise, you have a little bit of independence, you have the, the opportunity to socialize and, and maybe just some quiet time for your kid as they're walking to school. Uh, and this is a good example of how our intentions, what's best for our kid, doesn't necessarily map what the evidence says. And we let this sort of fear mongering drive our decisions. And look, we, we all do it. I'm not pointing fingers here. But just to be aware of those social forces can be liberating, right? It can allow us to make more mm -hmm. informed decisions. You go on your book to actually point out that this creates what you call as like a, a feedback loop, may, may, meaning that parents actually, because of this fear, they start driving their kids to school more. Uh, just explain how, like how maybe that does increase risk because there's more cars. <laughs> You're right. There, it, it is a strange feedback loop. And, it, and, and uh, it be, it's partly because as parents do it, right, it becomes the parenting norm. But, but we do have this what's called a cohort effect, right? So as more and more parents do it, it becomes the norm. And then, you know, ironically, then you have all this traffic outside, uh, outside the school, mm. and that does increase the risk to your kid. So, yeah, it, this is a complex problem, a lot of things going on here, but we really do want to stay, take a step back and get a sense of what does the evidence actually say. Okay, let's shift from parenting life to work life. Uh, many people have been working from home during the pandemic, and that means we're relying way more on emails and probably getting more emails uh, than we need. I always want to reply right away and be done with them and get like to zero inbox, but you write that some studies argue emails can actually be a huge time suck. So tell me how to handle email, my inbox. You know, the average person, you guys, checks the email, their email, I think it's uh, once every 7.5 uh, minutes. I, I always joke that if you if you see a crowd in when st crowds start forming again in a big city, you're basically looking at a crowd of email answerers, right? <laughs> that's what that's what we do yeah. at work. It stresses us out. So there's really interesting research that suggests that you know answering it all the time stresses us out, and also it's not good for productivity, not good for creativity. Uh, but caching it, as a lot of business gurus say, and, and caching it, that means like waiting till the end of the day or, or maybe just answering it once or twice a day is the way to go. But research tells us that also stresses us out. So too much, too little stresses us out. We need that Goldilocks point. And, and so research says for most of us, what we need to do is just find a rhythm that works for us. So try to block out 45 minutes a half hour, an hour uh, to, to, to not look at your email. And if you are really obsessed with email, believe it or not, that can be hard <laughs> just to find that time. But that's, you know, find that rhythm that works for you, turn off your alerts, find times during the day where you're email free. And by the way, at the end of the day, try to just shut down. I love that advice. I'm going to try to take that. Um, let's just point at the fact that like this book is is the latest in which you you do such a great job of untangling fa fact from fiction, in particular when it comes to health trends often being promoted by influencer and celebrity culture. But I'm just curious on a personal note, what it's like for you personally when you're like hanging out even virtually with family and friends uh, as being the guy who's like <laughs> poo-pooing all these latest fads. What's that like for you? I know I drive my fat. One of my kids called me the dream crusher okay <laughs> one of the, and, and one of my one of my kids uh she's uh, a young adult she's a little bit of a hippie like i won't say a little bit she's a full-on hippie so she's into all this stuff and she'll you know she'll be drinking something or going to do some exercise and she'll see me go uh and she'll just give me the you know the no <laughs> just shut up <laughs> i don't want to hear from you not now <laughs> this is my thing <laughs> leave me alone don't be a dream crusher Listen, we are not going to give you the hands up. We really loved having you here. Timothy, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Remember, Timothy's book, Relax, Damn It, it is available now. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.